that uh, the detection of underlying preeclampsia and shock. Uh, cradle 3 project. Special study modules, long wound, comb phone, elective poster prize, a Blair Bell, JH Field and Wrigley Prize, distinction in under underation and OBGYN well being of women elective, Rosley King College, London. Received the best poster prize. Um, and I'm really honoured to be able to present on behalf of the King's College team um, and Professor Andy Sherman, my supervisor. So I think in this audience um, we can answer this question of why do vital signs matter in pregnancy? And we've seen these numbers several times today. But as we know, the most common causes of maternal death worldwide are severe bleeding, pregnancy induced high blood pressure and sepsis. And together these contribute over 50% of all maternal deaths across the world. Now all of them are directly associated with abnormalities and vital signs. And as we know, there's simple cost-effective solutions to these problems. In low resource settings, however, there's many delays in these solutions being provided. So for example, inadequate access to accurate equipment and training in how to use it is a problem. And this can lead to delays in recognising maternal compromise, often until the woman's an extremist. And even at that point, there can be delays in referral to an appropriate healthcare facility. So there is a need for improved access to accurate uh, vital science measurements. We know that the gold standard of blood pressure measurement is the mercury sphygmo manometer. However, it's, it does require skilled users to be able to auscultate the crop cough sounds, and this is associated with user error. Also, they do need calibrating every two years, and concerns over toxicity of mercury has actually led to them being phased out across Europe. Observer error is actually really important, and um, this is old data from the tertiary hospital in, in, in London. When we looked at 180,000 blood pressure booking readings of antenatal uh, booking appointments, we found that nearly 85% of all those booking blood pressures ended in a zero, and no, less than 3% ended in a two, a four, a six, or an eight. So clearly the person taking the blood pressure has quite an important influence on what number gets written down. There's many other alternatives to uh, mercury available. Aneroid devices, they replace the mercury column, however they still require a skilled user to listen to the crop cough sounds. And automated devices, they take away that user error, but they have varying levels of accuracy. So, blood pressure devices, there's more than 500 devices available on the market. However, very few of them have actually been validated as accurate in pregnancy, and even fewer, about six on my last count, are actually accurate in women with preeclampsia. You might wonder whether these small errors actually matter. But in a non-pregnant population, we know that underestimation of blood pressure by just three millilitres of mercury causes nearly 20% of women with, of people with systolic hypertension to be missed. So if we can extrapolate that into a pregnant population, then these small errors really do have a huge difference. To validate a blood pressure device, it's quite a lengthy process involves two skilled users comparing the device to mercury um, for about nine readings, 45 patients, and takes about six months in total. This is just a brief list of some of the devices, automatic devices that are used across the UK widely. You'll probably recognise them from your, from your wards. Um, what you can see is, whilst, oh, whilst they're accurate in pregnancy, many of them are actually un inaccurate in preeclampsia, underestimating blood pressure by up to 25 millilitres of mercury. This is just a picture of an automated device that's not validated um, on the right-hand side. It was in a patient who'd had an eclamptic fit and received antihypertensives. You can see her reading was 138 over 66. And on the left-hand side, the microlife DSA, which is validated, showing that the blood pressure was 145 over 85, and therefore you probably want to continue monitoring. So with all this in mind, our team at King's College have developed the microlife cradle vital signs alert device. It's a semi-automated handheld upper arm blood pressure device and it measures blood pressure and heart rate. It was first validated as accurate in a non-pregnant population in 2006 and subsequently in a pregnant population including in preeclampsia in 2012. You can note the six year delay there and that's because it, that's how long it took to tweak the algorithm to make sure it really is as accurate as possible in the preeclamptic population. Most recently, it's been validated as accurate in a hypotensive pregnant population, and it's unique in that feature. It's also been developed to meet the World Health Organization criteria for use in a low resource setting. So not only is it accurate, but it's also cheap at $19 a unit, 
It's very easy to use and portable at 250 grams per unit. It's very robust, so it's gone extent under extensive testing by Microlife. Um, so you can, it's been dropped for 20 meters and you can still use it in extremes of temperature and humidity. Also, when it's inflated to over 300 milliliters of mercury over 20,000 times, its accuracy isn't changed. And during Cradle 1 trial, which was, uh, which was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates, we actually did some modifications. So we replaced the batteries, which were um, highly desirable in the community, to a fixed lithium battery, um, which can be charged using a micro USB port, which is the same as a mobile phone charger. It has a slow charge, it takes three hours, um, and the benefit of that is that you can do 400 readings before it needs charging again. So even in communities with variable uh, access to electricity, you only need to charge the device about once a week. And the, the latest feature that's been included um, is the inclusion of a traffic light vital sign alert. So the idea was that we wanted this device to be able to be used by every level of healthcare provider, even those who are less familiar with the numbers required to treat um, when a woman's compromising. So that this, this display will give a visual, a visual trigger of when action is required. So the lights are triggered by well-established hypertension thresholds, as you can see. But we also wanted it to be applicable to shock, and that's because we know that hemorrhage and sepsis are also really important causes of maternal mortality. So to work out the, uh, what we should, how we should look for this, we firstly analysed two retrospective data sets, one from the UK of 233 women, and one from a low resource data set of Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Zambia and Egypt, and that data was from the University of California with Sue Ellen Miller. Um, a 1,000 women. What we did is we looked at all of the vital signs and looked at their capacity to predict adverse outcomes. What we found was that shock index, which is a measure of heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure, was the most consistent predictor of adverse outcome compared to any other vital signs measure alone. So to, to determine the thresholds, we had to balance the sensitivity versus specificity of that measurement. So a shock index of less than 0.9 will trigger a green light. In this group, it has a very high sensitivity um, versus a practical specificity. So we know that in that group, there are no adverse outcomes from our retrospective data set. It's a good rule out test. These women are supposed to be well. Whereas a shock index of equal to or over 1.7 has a high, high specificity. So we know that these women uh, might have a problem. From our retrospective data set, three quarters went to intensive care, and two thirds had a major blood transfusion of over four units. So it's a good rule in test. Now, the, the way that the shock index and the hypertension are incorporated is a bit complicated, and I don't expect you to read all of this, but essentially, shock overrides hypertension. So if you had a woman who has borderline hypertension, but she's bleeding and becoming shocked, the shock light will, will be shown because that's most likely to cause that woman harm first. The Cradle 2 study was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates and it's just coming to an end. Um, and this is a 12-month prospective validation of those traffic lights in three district hospitals in, uh, in South Africa, Tiger Bird, Rita Stewart and Kimberley, and this is led by Herman Nathan. And also that the device that um, Dr. Bell had showed you earlier was the earlier model of the Cradle device, and that's been used in the CLIP trials. So we've had lots of opportunity for qualitative feedback around the implementation of the device in that context. The enthusiasm over the new code of ESA is, is sort of preceding the evidence. Um, it's been recognised by PATH's Innovation Countdown 2030 report as one of the top 30 devices, or top 30 innovations, I should say, um, with capacity to improve global health worldwide. And other things that were listed are things like kangaroo mother care and you try and balloon tamponade. However, it is important that really we show whether having this device and incorporating it into clinical care makes a difference or not. And to that end, we gained a £1.1 million grant from the Medical Research Council in combination with the Department of Biotechnology India, DFID and the Newton Fund to undertake a stepped wedge randomised control trial evaluating the impact of the cradle BSA on maternal deaths and severe morbidity in 13 low and middle income countries. So phase one has just come to an end. It was a three month feasibility pilot in these three sites, Ramberg, Bischofdu and Mashvindo in Zimbabwe. And phase two is the main, the main step to edge part of the trial, and that's occurring at these sites, and it's just started this week. So the design of the trial, the step to edge nature, is that all of these sites, they collect the main outcomes from now until the end of the trial, and then every two months, we introduce the intervention into each site, 
So at the beginning, no one has the intervention, and at the end, all the sites have the intervention, and we're able to compare the impact on maternal mortality and morbidity across the wedge and in each country individually. The intervention, of course, is the Cradle VSA and also a simple educational package. And we're introducing it into every level of care. So community providers where they're already engaged with programmes, so for example, traditional birth tenants in Haiti and community health volunteers in Malawi and in Zambia, into district clinics and also all the way up into the tertiary hospitals. And we're implementing the device into routine care, so we're, we're not changing pathways or, or management practice, we're just introducing it in, in the context of that environment. I thought I'd share briefly, if I have time, um, just some background of what happened in phase one. Um, there were slightly staggered delays due to um, translating the materials and also to civil unrest in Ethiopia in our trial site, causing a last minute change. But we were able to train over 200 people across all of the sites, which is over 90% of the total workforce. We were really pleased um, with, the, with the capacity to introduce into every level of care. We only took 15 interviews in three focus groups. Um, and, and gave 180, 108 questionnaires um, to our train to our birth attendants, um, and got 68 referral log books back. From this, we identified a few main themes, which I'll just share with you. Um, the device is easy to use, so just a quote from my registered nurse here in Ramadeg: "Anybody can record the BP anywhere, and even illiterate people can also record. Only by interpreting the colours, they can identify whether the blood pressure is high or low." It's also thought to improve decision making and referral practices, and this was reflected across all of our three sites. It helps you to take immediate action. It's the starting point for you to make further investigation, and it is really good. It gives you direction what you can do, and it helps you to do what you're supposed to do. And also, an unexpected finding for us was that women really like the lights. So another quote from here was that one observation is that earlier, when we used to tell that, the, the, that there was high BP, they were not listening. But now we show them the readings with the red lights, and when we say it is danger, they immediately agree. So these are just three brief examples that were reflected across all of our sites, but it shows to us that, we, that the device is being used and hopefully it has the capacity to make a, a change in the way that we expected it to. What we learned from this three-month pilot um, was that it is possible to introduce the device into routine care and that the training material is simple to understand, but there is room for improvement on those materials and we're just changing those in time for the first implementation in June this year. We only supply device in phase one with a power cable that can, with a USB, however, um, most people were, were wanting the adapted plug, so we're providing those ready for phase two. Also in phase one, all of our phase two sites, they collected the main outcomes so that we could test their pathways of, of data collection. And what we found was that stroke is actually an extremely rare uh, maternal outcome and that our intensive care facilities vary a lot between sites. So on this graph, um, you can see that Lusaka, the yellow columns, they are their intensive care unit admissions just for a sample one month of those three months. Lusaka had a huge number at 60 uh, intensive care admissions in that one month. However, Malago, which is a, a massive, probably the biggest sub-Saharan maternity unit um, with 33,000 deliveries, has a very small intensive care and therefore had much fewer um, admissions, and therefore it's not a very uh, practical measure of, of severe maternal morbidity. So for that reason, um, the main outcomes that will be included in the main trials just started are maternal death, eclampsia, and emergency hysterectomy. And the secondary outcomes will be intensive care admission, stroke, and also cause of death and intensive care admission, hysterectomy, and place of fit or death. We've adapted the training materials to make it easier for everyone to understand um, and we're very much looking forward to the trial commencing. I just want to acknowledge all of our team, a fantastic team um, across all of our sites. This is all of our primary investigators in Cape Town just last week um, and they've been working extremely hard to pass through all of the level of ethics and get this trial started. And I also just wanted to thank everyone who's got the trial to this point, so everyone in Cradle 1, Cradle 2 and uh, Cradle 3 and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Nicola, for your informative and uh, elaborative talk on the devices.